Okay, we have conquered our first technology challenge. Here we go. Here we go. Welcome to tonight's episodic creator hangout, the creating the series arc episode. My name is Claire Taylor. I am the director of programming and tonight we'll be doing an hour long discussion with five of Series Fest's alumni about all the key ingredients that go into the recipe for creating your season arc. A quick thank you to a few of the generous year round partners who help to bring us great programs like this. Visit Denver, Colorado Creative Industries and Liberty Global. We miss you. We wish we were in those Liberty Global offices with you. Um, before I bring on our panelists, uh, we have a very, very special announcement this evening. This past Tuesday, Series Fest and South by Southwest join forces on a virtual pitchathon. Six episodic creators pitched their ideas live to an all star panel. It was amazing. And tonight, we are announcing the winner. So the winner will receive an all access badge to the now virtual Series Fest season six and the results are in. <gasps> Live results. Okay, here we go. The winner is, <clears throat> it's a tie. Our panel of experts decided to award two selections from the lineup. Southfield Supernovas 4228 by Ruthie Morantz and Sophie, Finkel Sophie Finkelstein and The Beastly Boy from Matt Carlson and Chris Bolin. Congratulations, you guys, and congratulations to all of you who participated in the South by Southwest Film Festival episodic pitchathon. Series Fest is really proud to continue to build our community in the virtual space. And if you haven't already, please follow us on social media and sign up for the Series Fest newsletter for the most up-to-date information on all of our free virtual programs and upcoming announcements about the festival. Series Fest is a nonprofit organization. So if you like what you see tonight or anytime this week or are excited about what we've got coming up, please, please, please donate. All right, on to the main event. Tonight, I am joined by five talented filmmakers they are not only filmmakers, but they are five friends. I have had the extreme pleasure of getting to know each of them at festivals all over the country, from Minnesota to Vermont, New York City, Austin. And of course, when I've forced them to come hang out with me in Denver. So first up, I'd like to introduce Timothy Michael Scott. Timothy, if you wanna turn on your camera and your sound. We got him going. Here he is. Oh. Hey. hey. Uh, Timothy is the season five digital short series creator of the selection I Married a Lemon. And we met in New York at IFP. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And <laughs> we we got along right away. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, okay, next we have Mr. Jake Williamson. Jake, if you want to turn on your camera and your sound. Hey, Jake. Hello, hello. Hey, uh, Jake is the creator of season four's independent pilot competition selection, Adventure Capital, and also happens to be a fellow Colorado native. So we're giving some shout outs. Hey, 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 hey. hey. <laughs> hey. Um, next, we have Patrick Wimp. Um, Patrick, do you want to turn on your camera and your sound? Hi, hi. Hey, hey. Patrick is the creator of season five's Brothers from the Suburbs, which he won Best Direction in a digital short series for, as well as a season three selection, Public Housing Unit, for which he won Best Writer. I love Series Fest. <laughs> we love you too. That's so weird. We have that in common. Um, and last but not least, our final panelists for this evening are Sophie Marshall and Scott Gabriel. They are the creators of season five's independent pilot, best drama winner, Currency. Do you guys have your camera on? Great. I see you. Can I hear you? Hey. Hi. Hi. Nice to everybody. It's so good to see you guys. Um, you're all incredible and even more incredible for jumping in on this really special conversation with your fellow alumni. And I realized today that not all of you even knew each other before we started this. Um, so that was really special. And thank you for joining in this weird virtual creator Petri dish is kind of what it's become. And I think we've created something special. Okay. Absolutely. 
Well, thank, thank you so much, Claire. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And we're excited to, uh, to talk and, and, and uh, convey what we know uh, about uh, creating season arcs and all that that entails. Yeah, uh, and real quick before we get started, yeah. a reminder to the audience that we'll reserve the last 15 minutes for Q&A. So post, post, post all your questions for these guys in the YouTube chat and we will get to as many as we can. Fantastic. Thank you, Claire. Huh. Um, hey, uh, Jake, Patrick, Scott, Sophie, uh, so good to have you guys here. And let's, let's get started. Let's talk about um, character arcs as we get going. Um, what are the most important parts to you guys, um, anyone can start, um, about creating a character arc? How, how do you convey that? When do you convey that? What tools do you use uh, to convey where a character's going throughout a season or a series? Uh, I'll, I guess we'll jump yeah. in. Sure, yeah. let's jump in yeah. into this um, Petri dish. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I think we're we're kind of a cool uh, example or interesting example because we actually approach character differently and, and stop me if I'm saying something wrong about your approach. But, oh, I will. <laughs> um, I think Scott tends to approach um, characters as they relate to plot events and I tend to approach them as they relate to sort of their emotions and where I emotionally want them to be, um, which obviously you need both. And so when we write together it's actually really great to have that kind of back and forth where I'm constantly being like, well, what is the character feeling? What do we, what do we want them? Where do we want them to be emotionally at this point in the series or the pilot? And then he'll always be there being like, yeah, but what, what are the events that get them there? Sure. I think um, one of the things that, uh, that we start with often is a premise and we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that in a little bit or a world, but the next thing is a character and we want to convey that thought process. And I think often we actually start at the end. We start at where we want them to end up at the end of a story and then say, okay, what's the most interesting journey they could take to get there. And then we start them as polar opposite as the character can get. And then it just becomes about mapping sort of the pillars that hold that bridge up um, to get from A to B. Mm -hmm. And it becomes, yeah, foundational for the rest of the work we do. I, yeah, I want to piggyback off what you just said, Scott, that, that that's something that I'm always thinking about. And I think that's kind of a pillar of a good character arc is, well, to me, it's always intrinsically tied to theme. So whatever theme we're working with, how do you start your character with something? And I, obviously I'm talking protagonist, but there are many characters in, in a show. But for our main people, I, I always like to start them believing something about the world that then the world must push back on and challenge it and challenge it and challenge it. Um, and, and, and then I often think, you know, some people don't like to think this way. I do. Um, I love the thought of what do they want versus what they need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have that conversation all the time. Yeah. It's so helpful. I've, I've heard some people like kind of, um, not not dig that idea, but I think that over intellectualizes it. I, I think that's very helpful when creating a character arc. Do you want to talk a little bit about that for anyone who might not know the difference between character wants and needs? Well, for me, like uh, want is often tied into maybe a, an external goal. Um, they're going to want to go after something. You have to make your protagonist and your characters go after something tangible usually. So them going after something um, is interesting and all, but I love when things blindside them and that's usually what they need and that's what the world is telling them. Um, that That is totally at odds with what they believe about the world. Um, that's how I define it. Right, and, and I feel like often the want is, right, it's something that is more tangible and, and also more surface level, it's like, I want, if I only achieved this promotion, if I only became rich and, and, and powerful, then I would have everything I want. And of course, life doesn't actually work that way. What you actually need is what some people never realize throughout their whole lives. And, and, but hopefully a character gets to realize by the end that what they really need is someone who understands them. Or it's, it's often something that's a lot more internal. And uh, in a way, I guess I would say, less less superficial 
Yeah, but it might take them a really long time to get there. Yeah, Patrick. No, I mean, just yeah, jumping off that, I feel like for me, uh, the differentiator is always awareness, right? It's like the the want is something they're actively pursuing and they know they're after it. They want the love interest, yeah. the pot of gold, you know, whatever that need. Sometimes they're aware of it, you know, sometimes other people around them are. But yeah, it's that that kind of internal thing that surfaces throughout the course of that journey. And usually it's an expression of the the fatal flaw that I think yeah. is super important to write like right away. Definitely. Um, yeah. Can you say more about that fatal flaw? I think that, you know, like, um, obviously, I, I hate to do this because everyone always does this show and there's a billion different shows. But it's the thing that we all know, Breaking Bad. <laughs> it's a great it, one. Yeah, if you're taking like Walter White, obviously his his fatal flaw is that he's prideful. And, and that's something that must change or he'll die. And I guess I won't go into spoilers, but that like that's it's the fatal it's flaw. It's been a while. That, <laughs> that he keeps bumping up against. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think uh, something that has really helped me when, when I'm developing a series Bible or, you know, a pitch is who is the worst person for this particular situation? Who's going to butt heads the most? Who's going to be in, in many ways least suited to go through this? And that's how you can find out what someone really needs versus what they just wanted is they're, they're constantly uh, butting into obstacles because they are poorly suited. Like obviously Walter White has some, some things going for him in terms of what, what he becomes, but on the surface, he appears to be ill suited to become a kingpin. He's, mm -hmm. he's, he's meek. He's, he's beat up, he's beat up on. He has no, you know, autonomy. Um, people spit on him, you know, it's, it just seems like, how is this guy going to possibly progress there? And that's a, that's sort of what, you know, some, several people have been saying in terms of what, uh, what Scott in particular said in terms of starting at the opposite end, where do they end up? And then how can we go, they start out 180 degrees different at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It's always about change. Like that, that's when you're talking about arcs, that's all you want to do. You just want to have them believe something and then hit them over the head with the opposite. Okay, now let me let me just, for, for fun's sake, let me challenge that and talk about comedies um, where we might see someone change maybe by the end of the series, but in general, we probably don't want to see them change to those, it may go through those big changes or else they'll lose, like if Larry, I always say, like if Larry David suddenly became agreeable and introspective, there would be no show. Right. Well, they're just stuck on step two. It's just the right. world pushing up against their belief. Well, on sitcom like that, you know, Larry David's still kind of sitcom, like you have that like factory reset right at the end of yeah. the episode or the start of the next, it's, it's almost unique in that way where like your arcs are episodic but over the course of a season you know again it depends because different people play with you know how it's traditionally executed right but um you know ultimately like those things go away right otherwise like you're saying timothy there there is no show right like if, if they actually learn the, the lesson of the episode or you know grow as a human being then our hook is, is out the window totally so Scott and Sophie, what you missed is that we completely unlocked the key to creating <laughs> series arcs. It's just a simple formula and um, the, it's solved everywhere. Also, what what you missed is the that. utter failure of our internet in a cabin upstate. So <laughs> I guess everyone missed something there, didn't we? Didn't we all, yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's keep going with um, talking about season, season and series arcs because that is just a huge topic in itself how you know how do you approach that how do you approach crafting that planning that how far you go each episode cliffhangers all all of that maybe scott and sophie you guys want to start since you uh were busy sure just <laughs> stop us if we're just rehashing things you talked about in the glorious minute and a half we missed <laughs> <laughs> it was glorious i mean I, it goes back to what sort of what we were saying in character once we have our world and premise um, are we going to talk about sort of premise or world? I think we start there. Yeah, we'll, we'll, like, we'll, who's the most we'll, interesting character? 
once we break down those tent poles, know where we're starting, know where we're ending, it really becomes about a, an act structure. Um, and I don't think there's any rule that it's got to be three acts or four acts, but there's there's definitely a conversation we have about uh, breaking it down like that, knowing knowing what rising tension is owning each beat of that story to get from starting with a character here and bringing them over to here. Mm -hmm. And what's cool, I think, about about thinking about a series or a season arc or a series arc, both of them, is you have so much time to allow characters to develop and change and grow and surprise you in a way that in film, you really don't kind of have that luxury. In film, it, the arcs have to be so much tighter because of the limited space. And so I think something we enjoy a lot when we get to that point where we're talking about, well, what is the season progression is really figuring out like, what can we do to our characters to, to really make them change and, and how can we viscerally feel that change? Um, and I think some of my favorite TV shows just take you on that journey. And I, I love that about TV. And there's sort of a gorgeous geometry to it or an engineering mindset I think that we bring to it where it's, it's, it's definitely art, but there's also a science to it. There's a real thought process. Um, you know, a lot of people probably know that the common wisdom and not that any common wisdom shouldn't be abused and broken constantly, but um, that if your, your season or your story ends on a sad note, you wanna to build towards a nearly happy note somewhere towards the end so that you can really subvert expectation. And, and the reverse is true too, where if you wanna end with an underdog winning, you bring them to the pit of despair right before, right? What's fun in a, in a series and something that you don't get necessarily in, in movie writing is the opportunity to do both at once. You might have one plot arc or character arc that ends in triumph and you bring them to the pit of despair, even as you're giving them near victory and then crushing them at the end in a different way or a different character. And so it's really fun to watch those sort of intertwine and have the opportunity to do that. I think it was a good choice to start like with character as you guys talked about character and character arc because it does all come out of that. Right? As Sophie talked about like knowing where we're going, then you know, for me, it's much like Scott and Sophie, um, kind of that structural engineering of you know, not just the, the structure and those key plot points for the episode, but here's, you know, across the season, you know, in episode three, I'm hitting, you know, this first act turn of the, the series, right? And, you know, so on from there. So, um, you know, I like to kind of build off your traditional structure, pick your poison, right? Three act, four act, five act, hero's journey, you know, whatever you like. Um, but then also like leave that room for organic discovery and, you know, really like like they mentioned like hurting my characters you know or if the characters decide to do something weird like let it go to that place um but yeah having that backbone i think helps yeah the, the, i think the backbone of things that you should be aware of is usually um you know like there's certain things like you said you mentioned a reversal at the end of an act you want something to happen that's going to hit the the ball the other way and uh often those things will happen if you're thinking about, like you said, Patrick, just character, you start with them. And, and then all the things that you read in, in all the books will happen usually. If you're, it, it, because we've read those scripts too, or we've seen the things where all of a sudden uh, we've seen the projects where it feels hollow uh, because they're trying to hit things they think they need to hit, but there's no character to to reinforce it if you're not starting with character or at least for me i, I think you're in big trouble right you know, that's, in terms that's... of unpacking it oh i was gonna to hop in quick often i think when you can't figure out what to do to a character to let them work through something it's often the answer is just about unpacking the world and the place and the life you've put them in i think there's a lot that just organically comes out not to invent something new but to really think about well okay if this is the scenario we place them in, and if this is what they're doing, what are the other little problems they face? What are the natural, if I was going through it, what would I face? And I think, yeah, and again, like I think so much comes from, I'm a theme guy, like I love theme. If you're working, I, I just watched, I don't know if you guys saw it, The Outsider, HBO. Oh, I love the Outsider. Isn't it great? <laughs> okay, so that's a perfect example. I'm watching, I'm rewatching Watchmen too, because I think it's so, I think it's so great. I haven't um, seen it, no spoilers. Yeah, no spoilers. No spoilers. But, but the outsider, the outsider is so perfect because the character believes what we're dealing with is belief. He just, he's a detective. He's hard-nosed. He wants evidence. 
And what we're dealing in that show is, is in a world where there is no evidence. That maybe things can't be explained. And he and and then every other plot device, every other character that is is being introduced, every other thing that's he's coming up against is an expression of the opposite of what he's believing. And I love that. And that fi fixes so many problems because then you don't have to do any, people aren't gonna watch your show and be like, where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. Right, you don't have to, that, I mean, that reminds me of X-Files, for example, where you have this engine kind of built in permanently is that one believes in one, mm -hmm. one believes in one believes in science and one believes in something that the other would not regard as science. And it's like, boom, you have a, you have constant combustion. Um, Challenging um, worldviews, exactly. Yeah, um, I love that. But how, so how do you decide how far to go within a season? Because, right, because when you're pitching it, you might say, oh, we're going to go this far. And, you know, the, the, the main character is caught in a spot that she simply can't get out of. The, or the house is burned down and the business has fallen apart and the family has left. And, every, you know, how far do you go each when you're pitching, when you're talking about each cliffhanger or each uh, season ender. I'm really drawn, I think this is to some degree a matter of the genre and the taste, um, yeah. but I'm really drawn to stories where the entire premise is subverted between seasons, where you thought you were watching one sort of show and then really organically by the end of the first season, you realize that, well, it was a money heist, but now it's a monster in the house show. And then at the end of that, there's a new archetype of story and, and the entire series is changing in structure because of whatever happens at the end. And that feels like a good breaking point to me. Yeah, on the, on the other hand, that's hard to do, I think. And, and every, we all have shows where they had an amazing season and they ended on what was an amazing cliffhanger, but then had no idea where they were going after that. Right. And the next season, the show just tanks. And, and some shows recover from that and they realize it. But you, I think that's kind of where the series arc versus the season arc comes in. And, and, I, and I agree, I love taking shows to that just really surprising point at the end of a season, but you better have a plan for, for what, how you want to kind of recover from that and what your reset will look like in the next season. And, totally. Yeah. And then Timothy can speak to this, I'm sure, but comedy is totally different, right? Sometimes you don't want to change it at all. You just want to keep watching that thing play out mm -hmm. um, or not, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, you want it. You 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 want the character's situation. I would say, to you want to end on a cliffhanger, and yet you want to see that same character in the. You don't want their character to have fundamentally changed. You might want their situation to have changed, mm -hmm. but ideally, that's an escalation of the problems that they had in the first season. Um, and so, so the, it's not that the show is brand new. It's just that they are in a worse place than ever before, and they'll face greater challenges that bring out whatever made us fall in love with that character um, to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, whether you know whether that's their ornery nature or their unwillingness to look inside themselves or whatever made them funny in the first place. And sticking to, you know, Jake's kind of like character at the heart of the thing, like I, you know, I tend to treat character as like the soul of it, right? It's the, the thing that makes it unique, right? If, if all these structures are, you know, similar in some type of way, um, you know, just back to that idea of, of transformation and of arc or, or failure to transform, right? But if it's like, you know, this was the end point that I targeted for, you know, this particular growth of the character, or this is the theme I wanted to explore, right? Like, I think that those things, um, they reach a logical conclusion, whether it's a positive or negative conclusion. And, you know, then out of that, you want to pivot to the, the new status quo for season two, season three, and, and so on. I love that. Yeah, the new status quo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know what that is, just, you know, I don't know who's watching right now, status quo is sort of, you start any story establishing the world we're in, and then we see an incident that changes that world forever, or very often, that's what we see. Um, so the, the new status quo is the world we're in at the beginning of a second season or a third season, it's the new status quo because things have changed. Often at the end of a story, you'll come back to that and see how the new status quo and the old status quo are different because of the story you've watched. I've been thinking a lot too about like, I don't, I don't know who coined the term. It's like fractal theory. And this is very like, what you want is, is 
stasis, conflict, crisis, resolution. And you can blow that up and shrink that as much as you want. So uh, to me, that really helps when I'm writing a season or a scene or an episode because you can fit, you know, a scene is that. We start in stasis and then there's an inciting incident and there's conflict and that's moments too. But if you blow that up to a season, every single hour long drama you see follows that. It has to for, uh, for whatever reason for us to resonate with it. We get close to the end and there is a huge thing that's going to happen that's, that makes it more exciting that makes us want to watch the next thing. Well, that's the crisis event happening, playing out longer than it would in a, in a you know, just a single episode. A cool I, example is uh, Silence of the Lambs. I don't know if you've ever watched, I, I, was, I, I watched it recently and, and sat in on a friend's film class and they broke it and every scene is actually three mini scenes where there's a status quo, a crisis, and then a new status quo. Yeah. Every single one, it's, I had no idea to done that, it's amazing. In yeah, the, in the fractal study of that, at its smallest. Yeah, I think. Well, I th I see it all the time. You, it, every single freaking scene you see, but it's good to me. That's good writing. You watch the West Wing, and that's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's okay. Let's. Uh, w w I know this. You know, everything is intertwined, of course. But let's talk about um, world building a little bit and how how you establish a world, especially one that is not exactly our own, but it can also, so it's in the future, it's in the past, but, or fantasy, but it could also be not like our own in that it's something we don't know about. Like I'm thinking about stuff set, you know, in law school and I have not been to law school. So I need to know what that status quo looks like, or it might be set in a particular company. And it's like, this is a company that most of us have never worked for, or it's made up. So none of us have worked for. So how do we, how do you guys go about establishing that which I think will then filter naturally into discussion of the pilot, which we're, we're gonna do next. Scott and Sophie, you must've done a lot of that in currency, I would imagine. Like that's a lot of world building. Yeah, yeah it was um, a, a sad <laughs> like little, sorry. Do you wanna give like the little log line for currency? So it's- <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah, sure. um, is, we've cool. seen it, but. <laughs> yes, good idea. Yeah, so it's, it's actually about an economic breakdown and um, uh, it's probably shelved for the time being because nobody wants to watch a, a, a near apocalypse story right now and I don't blame them. Um, but what it is, is it's a story about what would happen if electronic money glitched out in a cascading malfunction and people couldn't access their bank accounts. They could see their money, but they couldn't touch it. And everyone thinks money's gonna come back and they wait a day and two and 17. And so the story takes place in a little town where a Cuban immigrant family runs a gas station mini mart and realizes they have food and fuel, the two things that everybody needs. So it's about a, a, a small town, uh, you know, blue collar guy, who, uh, a store owner who becomes a small town dictator and a Wall Street broker who moves home with his tail between his legs, having lost everything in the way their lives changed the town. So that's the character and the world and the plot. And that's um, why it's coming up because it took a lot of world building, of course. Um, yeah, how did we approach that? Um, yeah, I think- I think it. it looked great. Thank Thanks, you. Um, I think for that you project- You look great. <laughs> Um, as well, like we, we like sort of, uh, I guess, I guess we've realized that a theme, a theme we like to write around is sort of complex, um, situations like that, like sort of sociopolitical situations. Mm -hmm. So for that one, I think, and what we tend to do in general is just, uh, figure out the questions we need to ask and then talk to the people that have the answers. So for currency, we talk to resilience, uh, officers and managers for big cities we talk to gas station owners about um, how they get food and gas and, and paper products and all that stuff delivered. We talk to um, supply chain experts supply and chain economists. Experts, yeah, a high level economist who helped us. Like he, he kind of shed the light on the idea that after people miss their second paycheck, they really start to panic. And that proved to be completely true, um, which we saw with the government shutdown. Um, yeah, I, I think there's one more thing to highlight in the world building and then we should totally turn it over to you guys as well. Um, but I think story, there's a saying story loves process. And I think inside of the world building, you do a lot of that process work. And what that means is just that if I can watch, we're working on a story right now that, that, that is about the mayor of a city and just seeing how a mayor runs an election is fun to watch. It's just fun to watch. It doesn't, before the character, before the conflict, everything else aside, we like watching 
worlds we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. by doing the work to, to understand those worlds ahead of time, you know, we just, we get such an advantage. We just feel like experts in whatever we're writing about because, and it's not, it's just from talking to people who know what they're talking about and really truth checking it constantly. Um, yeah. And then at least the character and the plot and everything else, yeah. It's funny, Scott, you talk about that because I'm working on a piece too about a mayor, but mine is in a, a very, very small town. And it's so small that I called up the town and got a hold of the mayor's cell phone. And we had an hour long conversation about what it's like to be a mayor in the small town. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And now if you have any questions, you can call them at all hours of the day. Oh, and seriously. Yeah, she was like, well, you let me know when this is coming out. And I was like, I, I hope that's not a pejorative accent, but it, it, she sounded like that. And she, she was, you know, she, we would just talk, you know, she, she was so willing to talk to me. And even though I was cold calling her, like wow. I'm from New York, I'm, you know, I'm writing a screenplay. Can you talk to me? And I was like, so how, how do your elections work? Like, how many people vote for you? And she was like, oh, honey, we, no, 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 no. City council votes me and nobody votes for me. <laughs> Just <laughs> that's interesting. Wow. Like, that's fascinating. I want to know more about that, right? <laughs> yeah, but don't you like that? That's going to change everything in the script, right? Yeah, that, that's how our like we this gas station owner that we talked to, we we just asked him questions that you could tell obviously no one ever asked him we were like well where do you get like cold cuts from where, where does the toilet paper come from and he he was like so excited to tell us all these answers because who was ever asking him that um and it was kind of awesome yeah but along those lines how how much do you adhere to the truth or your research um versus you know, this, that doesn't work for the story that doesn't enhance the story or the character's journey. Um, how do you, how do you decide, you know, yeah, how much truth uh, of the literal truth to put in versus the truth of the storytelling? I have like two thoughts. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah Patrick. Oh, Patrick, yeah. Um, well, one, just, I love that you, you both, you all talked about research, right? Cause I feel like for me, those conversations and, and looking into things and finding the truth like activates new ideas, better ideas, you know, that, that change your storytelling uh, in a good way. And to that question about truth. So like um, my show that, that was at Series Fest 5 um, is loosely based on my life in high school. So there was a lot of like choice around like, okay, what's what do we represent as reality? What, you know, um, what do we need to, to fictionalize? And um, you know, it's, it's kind of always that like gut creative balance, right? I mean, very often with, with some stories, um, you know, that, that old, like truth is stranger than fiction saying rings true, right? Like reality, um, very often comes up with people and characters and plot lines, um, that we could never fabricate in our wildest dreams. Uh, look at the tiger King, right. <laughs> or something like that. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that piece of it. Um, but then, you know, for, for this thing that I just did, um, Brothers from the Suburbs, um, that was really about like finding like, okay, you know, back to Jake's ideas of theme, right? Like, or, or character arc, like who are the fictional characters I'm trying to represent? And, you know, how then do I balance, you know, representing a reality with, you know, where they need to go versus just documenting the, the truth of, of what happened in a situation or place. Uh, and that's, it's kind of specific answer, but you know, that was, that was kind of my goal. I think all my answers seem to be going back to character. Yeah. 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 I don't think I let truth get in the way of what's entertaining too often. So, you know, it's, it's all dictates of the story, but you know. Right. And it's the character's truth is, uh, supersedes the truth of what actually, I mean, I always put it. say like, no, no one, how many people know what actually happened or are going to do the research or an expert in this particular part of history or, you know, this part of the future. No one's an expert in that because no one knows the future. So it's like, let's, let's worry about the truth of the character and what their journey is going to be like and what they learn about themselves and their needs. Look at like biopics, right? It's like the biopic becomes the thing that people think really happened, right? Like Absolutely. social network is now the Mark Zuckerberg biography for, for better or worse. Yeah, I think a lot of it also, there's a, a, please, what, Jake? No, I was just saying that you're trying to get to the feeling of what happened, not what happened happened, you know? Absolutely. 
And it kind of, there's a, there's an interesting ethical line. I think this is actually a, a weird example. I'll kick over right now. We're dealing with this, this story about a mayor and I won't, won't share too much about it, but um, we are talking about a real estate industry. And in this real estate industry, this, in this particular place, uh, there are some bad things that happen. And so we're in a weird spot because in order to call out this particular place, this particular industry, right, we actually feel a bigger obligation to the truth when painting this world in a pejorative light mm -hmm. because we want to paint it in a pejorative light. Right. And so if we were being nice to it, um, I would take all the license in the world. When we're, when we're poking that bear, um, it's too easy to dismiss the story as fiction if we don't do that work. And, and I think that along with the truthiness you're sort of saying, the heart of the truth rather than the literal truth, the story truth is important. But also if we're taking a social position on something, I think not being one-handed, not just fighting for whatever side you believe in, but really painting the worst of the other side accurately is important in order to claim your credibility. That's a good, did you see Unorthodox on Netflix? Okay. It's, it's on our, it's on our list. Yeah. It's been busy in this cabin, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. can, I, can I ask one more question on all this? Do you guys do crazy walls? Do you have a, uh, you, you have all of this information, you have these character arcs and these plot arcs and these setting rules or world rules. How do you map it all? How do you track it all as creators? Do you have Excel spreadsheets or crazy pieces of thread like like serial killers? Um, <laughs> yeah, what, we have. What, what do you guys do? Well, I do, serial but not killer. for my TV shows. Yeah, just for <laughs> the people that you serial killer. Yeah, yeah. In a community. Um, right. But also, how, and, and just along those lines, um, how do you figure out how much uh, to convey in a story Bible or a pitch like, do you, are you breaking it down by every episode or just like a summary, sort of a sentence or two about this particular character's arc and that particular storyline? So that's kind of like related to how, how do you keep it organized? Because uh, sometimes when you make it too granular, I think, when you're like, well, in episode three, by episode three, she has to this, and by episode four, she has to this, then the sort of the bigger threads um, of a character's evolution and of a story's evolution can just get lost. But yeah, how do you guys do it? Yeah, you gotta leave space for spontaneity, that's for sure. I'm not organized to do that. I wish I was one of those people who had a wall. I wish I was. I have crazy writings and I like it's in my phone, it's in my notebook and it's so scattered and it's so what my life is, but somehow I can make sense of it. But I, I wish I was one of those people who had spreadsheets. But if I do that, I don't write. Yeah, I'm I'm very much like Jake, where it's like like process wise, like I start out by just kind of having like a lot of like vomit documents, like whatever's there is the idea, like get all that down. Oh, it's, you know, I'm going to bed and so here's a thing, you know, here's five new notes on my phone. And then here's one of my three notebooks with the other stuff. And then I'll start to turn that into more formal documents of like, like I'll usually have you know, like a formal outline, some formal character docs, but like, as I funnel down, a lot of the time I'm leaving those things behind, like to, to leave yeah. room for that spontaneity. Right? It's, it's again, almost back to this idea of the, um, the emotional truth or, or those kind of things, right? It's like, you'll maintain the core of what's good. And then like, we can step to here. And then, you know, as if there's rooms to kind of fill in the gap or you, you let, you know, at least for me, my, my creative mind wander, um, I'm allowed to have those organic discoveries. And then I also find like I'm subconsciously representing some of the things that were organized at the beginning, right? Like they just do trickle down, you know, for whatever reason. Yeah, per personally, I, um, you know, I'll create, you know, huge lists of crises, um, problems, conflicts that could happen to the character or to some unnamed character, who knows, within this the season within the entire show, within this particular um, story arc, whatever it is. And then I'll try to start sort of um, grouping them by even like by the theme of each episode. So so if you just say, okay, this episode is about loneliness, for, for example, just to start to sort of organize and say, okay, these three or five conflicts could happen under the heading of loneliness. And then we go to the next theme for episode three, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how I would kind of start to both brainstorm and be narrowing it down so that 
there's some sort of order to why these particular conflicts are within a particular episode and how does that track on the bigger arc of the entire first season, for example. Sophie and Scott, you have, you have detective walls, don't you? I bet you do. In that we cabin. Do. We do. <laughs> I, I'm gonna thank you I, for calling them detective walls. Yeah, I'm gonna both <laughs> blame and and I guess admire Scott for being the one that brought this to to our process. I was never like that. Um, I'm not a, a disorganized person. Like I don't have notes all over the place, but but I was really resistant to like cutting up the index cards and tacking them on the wall and writing stuff out. But oh my it, God, it's such good background processing time. As you're chopping, useful. your brain is just working. Yeah. Your menial labor is amazing. It's for... nice to get away from the computer too, like to be mm. able to just be standing there and have holding something physical and like moving it around. We only do that really at the very beginning of the process when we're, we're just trying to like get get the outline going and then we switch to a digital format pretty quickly for editing purposes but i do find it um actually very helpful yeah i think what's cool about combining i love all of this and i love that everyone's different and and timothy i think i'm gonna like borrow your lens the cool thing about all of this is you can overlay each other's lenses and one of the great things about this conversation claire thank you for having us is i get to take timothy's idea and like okay this episode is about loneliness so let me just relook at all of my beats here in in that lens and then tweak as needed. And that's an awesome overlay. Um, Great. But yeah, we do. And, and then the other cool thing is as you're doing that kind of structural outline, all that other stuff uh, that Patrick and Jake were talking about, those snippets of conversation or those scene flashes are coming anyway. And so we're having these long debates about the structure and like what's gonna be in, in episode one and what's gonna be in two. But at the same time, we're both kind of writing off on the side, taking notes of flashes and we're like, oh, this goes here, this goes there, this is terrible. And, and so that kind of works itself in anyway. Also, it looks really impressive when someone walks into the room. Impressive? <laughs> <laughs> you going with impressive on this? I'm going with impressive. Okay. People, people come in, they're like, oh, is this the project you're working on? Because they see like- It does look cool. Stuff, even yeah. though it's complete gibberish, like, they're like we left it there because we walked away in despair with no ideas. It still looks impressive. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we so you know in our remaining time before we get to the questions, we got to talk about the pilot. How far do you go in the pilot? How do you introduce that new status quo by the end of a pilot? How do you how do you make an entry point into a show? Because that that gets that can be so frustrating and so confusing. And just it, it has to get people on board. But if you go too, you can't go too far. But you can't go far enough. How, how do you do that? How do you approach that? There's a whole hour we could dedicate to writing the pilot. I mean, <laughs> Two minutes, go. <laughs> I think the pilot's like a microcosm of the series as a whole. You have to let people. There's certain things I keep in mind. You have to let people know what they're in for. What's the show about? What, what are you about to see? What are you tuning into? So what's the conflict and what what, what are we coming in to, to witness? Um, it usually, I think that if you start with a teaser and you're doing, you know, you're working with four acts, kind of keep that consistent. Um, like I, I think the teaser or the, uh, the pilot's the place where you put your best foot forward and you, you get on with it and you say that here's, here's what it's going to be. Here's what the show is about. Yeah. And I think, I think there are so many pilots that I, I read with my, my clients where it just doesn't, it doesn't go far enough. So we're just like, okay, but I don't, by the end, I want to know what journey this person is setting upon, whether it's a comedy, whether it's a drama, whether it's a dramedy, I just want to know, okay, we're in for this sort of quest. And if, if they kind of move from, you know, A to A, you know, they don't even go from A to B, it's just like halfway there. I'm like, but I, then I don't really know what I'm in for, as, as Jake is saying. In the Breaking Bad pilot, so much happens. So, so much, much happens. Though, that you forget, like, you're like, oh, that was episode three. And it's like, no, 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 no. There was shit sloshing around in the van episode one. Like that, so much happens. I try to keep that in mind too. Right, and, and a lot of people, oh. I think a lot of people's first instinct is to sort of reserve that and be like, oh, you you, you can't believe the twist I have planned for episode two, three, and four. And it's like, uh, no one's gonna actually get there if they're not willing to take that journey yeah, you're not by seeing good. how much story you can burn in episode one. Absolutely. 
the, the entry point is, is absolutely, I mean, don't withhold the good stuff. That's uh, I think that's a mistake that I, I made early on and a lot of people make early on is like, oh, but it's gonna get so much better. I can't, they can't wait to get better. What's the hardest pilots to, to I imagine to write. Um, actually, you know, before I, Patrick, what are, I have a, a specific thought about Ozark I wanna kick by okay. anyone who's seen it. But before I do that. Yeah, uh, Patrick, yeah I'll, I'll give the quick, you know, I think to that point, I'm fairly insistent on like ending with either like a big emotional gut punch or a cliffhanger, right? Something that's going to make you want to keep watching. Um, you know, I'm kind of a like film three act structuralist, at least in terms of how I arrange things. So like, if you think about a movie, right? Like, you know, uh, if you're in a 10 to 13 episode season, let's say like you're basically at inciting incident territory, right? Like you're at like, the hook the hook must happen by you know this page count or this section of the thing so you know you, your pilot needs to do that your pilot needs to alter that protagonist world um and you know get us kind of on that track so you know i i agree with what everyone has, has said here right you want to lead with your best stuff um especially you know all of us as independent creators like we're hoping someone's going to read the whole pilot right you're hoping someone's going to watch more of the thing so like if you don't bring it like they're not going to at all so do you right. and, and your pilot is 0 to 15 of a movie script you kind of think of of the end of your pilot as the inciting incident of a movie kind of i mean it depends right like it it, it may be more of like a plot point one like point of no return depending on what the story is um but at least you know in terms of how i'm you know structuring it across the season and like the the size of the event, right? Like the the um, the impact of that twist or reversal. Um, I need to at least be there, you know. Uh, at that I, I would I would even go even farther personally, where I would say it's the entirety of Act One of a film, sure. because by by the end of Act One, you know, by about twenty five percent of the way through the film, or or less these days, it's more like fifteen to twenty percent. If you don't know what kind of journey we're about to embark on, you'll be like, ah, I could just switch to something else on Netflix. Yeah. So that's like the perfect example of the hardest kind of pilot I see. And, and we struggled with this uh, at least once. And I don't know if you guys have seen Ozark. And without spoiling anything, um, at the end of the pilot, we realize that the entire show is going to take place, and this isn't a spoiler, in the Ozarks. <laughs> and right. the, the pilot doesn't take place there. And yeah. the, the world they set for the first hour you're watching the show has to establish tone, establish character, establish themes. And then at the end of it, they're not even in that place anymore. And that yeah. kind of pilot, where you're getting all the exposition, all the backstory. And yeah. to make that exciting to watch is incredibly hard. That's really elegant, isn't it? I think that's such elegant writing. I, I've gotten to a point where I've, I've, re I've read so many screenplays. That's all I'm reading usually. So now when I sit down to write, read a book, which I used to love reading, I'm always like, oh my God, <laughs> enough explanation. Get to it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Are you guys ready to jump into some audience questions? We, we love there questions. Oh, sure. here we go. Okay. Here's one. Um, Jason Coombs asks, when you are creating a series Bible and your series, your season arc, do you attempt to write as many episodes as you can, or do you focus on making the pilot as strong and layered as possible? The latter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, the pilot, no one's going to read more than the pilot. And if the pilot's not good enough, no one's going to read the pilot anyway. So I think the pilot is first and foremost, the absolute strongest piece you need to have. And your and your format. I mean, I think what we're we're calling a Bible a lot is actually a format. It's it's a shorter document. It's maybe fifteen pages, not sixty or seventy. And um, and uh, they'll read that. But to write more than one episode is to waste your time because wherever you go, they're going to have thoughts. They're going to have notes. They're going to have ideas, and they want to enroll themselves by contributing to the story. So you're you're truly going to have to rewrite it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make sense to write more than that. I, I couldn't agree more. They 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 an executive. You know, an executive is there for a reason. They love TV. Um, they love the business. They have contributions to make, to make things better. They've seen where things go astray and where things, their, their projects in the past have worked. So you better believe that if, if they're, they're going to offer you notes on that first episode. And if you're not incorporating notes because you're like, oh, we don't get to that till episode six or whatever, and which is already written, they're going to be like, oh, this person doesn't, isn't really flexible. They're not really willing to work with me. And I, I can't have any say in it, so what, what, you don't need me. I, 
you don't need me anymore, you know? And it's like, oh, that's not a position you want to uh, be in to put or put an executive in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, along that same note, while we're talking about kind of like the making of things, what made you guys decide to create your pilots versus just pitching your script? Nicholas Olivas is asking. I bet, I bet you we all have the same answer, but I, I want to hear what, what you guys say. <laughs> I think that in a, in some ways, um, making it can be kind of like the cheat code. Like, you know, if you're just writing something and someone's reading it, like they have to visualize what's in your head and they have to buy into that. And there's like a bunch of steps, um, you know, if you can make it and make it well, you know, like now you have something that people are more willing to look at, in my opinion, they're more willing to watch something than read something. Um, and now, you know, the thing that sounds like a crazy idea on paper is now visualized and it really works well. And, you know, everyone thinks you're great. Um, so I think that, you know, for me, that was kind of part of it. I have I the same, I have the okay. same, yeah, I have the same exact answer is people think about your, Think about, I'm thinking about myself. Would I rather see uh, see something or would I rather read something? Well, nine times out of 10, it's just gonna be easier. I'm gonna get more uh, from seeing the actual product than reading the screenplay. And executives would much rather see something than read too. They read all day long to actually see what a vision is um, can go so, so much farther in illustrating. Yes, this work, I don't have to make any leap of imagination to think, oh, this might work on the screen or might not. It already works on the screen if you've made it. Um, well, they then they can judge it from there, but they don't have to make a leap of faith that I think this will make uh, good visuals and good action and all that. I think writing something is in, like writing something good is incredibly hard to do. Writing something good and then making something good enough to get you exposure is, uh, a, a height that's really, really hard to, it's a definite to, hurdle. to do. And if you do it, you're going to get noticed in an industry that is near impossible to get noticed in. Not that that's expressly why we did it. However, I do think that's true. And that was a little on our minds when we, when we were like, let's shoot it. We believe in it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's not wait to get permission. And if I could throw one more thought before giving to Scott and Sophie, like, you know, for me, it, it allows you to engage with people who can make it better, right? Like you can bring in actors who are going to take your words and give them life that, that just isn't there on the page or like find new readings. And, you know, so like, again, we're assuming everyone's executing these things well. Um, you know, I think that there's opportunity there also. Right. I, I, I would say, you know, I've, we've also probably all seen pilots where um, it was like something that really needed a huge budget or, or better actors or something. And we're like, oh, okay, that, that didn't work the way, that didn't open the doors that you wanted it to. But if it's something within your means and you can execute it well, that will open so many doors. But Scott and Sophie, yeah. Um, I think a part of all of the reasons that, that you guys have all mentioned, and I think at the time we were just really hungry to shoot something um, and kind of wanted to test our relationship with each other. And we knew a lot of good, our, our shooting, like directing, writing relationship. And we had a lot of um, really talented friends. We both come from the indie film world. Um, I'm a feature editor and Scott's a director and writer. And so we had just all of these talented people around us that we just wanted to work with. And we had our script and felt like, why not? Exactly kind of, uh, what you guys were saying, let's not wait for someone to give us exactly the amount of money we, we would ideally want to shoot it. Let's not wait for all that. Let's just decide that we're going to do it and make it happen. And it was successful because we got to, well, we got to meet all of you and be here right now. But um, let me also place a, a fly in that ointment a little bit. Um, I don't think it's worth doing if you're not going to do it well. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's worth doing the, the, DSLR, no lighting, because we have no money and that's fair and you don't have any friends with lighting or know how to use lighting. I don't think it's worth making something mediocre as a sales tool for a great script, if that's what we're kind of saying. Yeah. I think it's worth doing it well or relying on the writing. I think the second thing, the, the, the second fly is 
I, I think a lot of people wonder if they should shoot a full 60 minute pilot. And I think my gut answer, but you know, I'm only speaking from my own experience and I'll kick this back to you guys is no, I don't think there's much reason to spend the blood and money and time to shoot a 60 minute pilot in drama or a, a full 30 minute comedy pilot because you're gonna have to reshoot it. The network that picks you up is gonna wanna reshoot the whole thing anyway. There's not a single meeting we've had that ran contrary to that. Um, unless you're going to self-distribute, which is totally fine and fair, or unless you're on or, certain platforms, yeah. I think you guys are on Quibi also. I think now there's there's more, a little more room for yeah. for for content creators who who do have the whole thing to just get bought and put on a platform like Quibi or Fiction sure. or something. But, um, other, but for the bigger networks, um, yeah, and it's like it's it's so um, like awkward to think about, I guess. But the one of the best tools that came out of us shooting our pilot is the one minute trailer that we cut from our very yep. expensive footage yeah. Yeah. to shoot. And that trailer, people love it. And, and it's gotten us so many meetings and conversations and we haven't even needed to show those people the other 15 minutes because it's all there. They, they, they trust what they see in the trailer. So that was a very expensive lesson to learn as well. But we also wanted to show that we I, could I, do it, right? Yeah. At a high, at a, at a network yeah. level, we could produce this thing. And so I think that's the another point of validity is like, we didn't want to just sell it and hand it off. We wanted to be part of that process. We wanted to be in the room. We wanted to help run the show. And I think showing that we could do that was important. So even if they didn't watch it, knowing that there was a mini episode out there, a pilot out there um, was important. And also, I, I of course, um, having going out there and shooting um, a good pilot lets you participate in something like Series Fest, which was is so awesome. Um, you meet all these people and people are just there supporting you. You learn so much. You get to see what other people are creating and that in itself is massive. And, and I think that's been one of our favorite parts of having shot the thing is just being able to, to take it out and participate in different festivals like that. Your faces. Yeah, I think, I think. I'm blushing and I'm smiling yeah. and I'm kind of crying. <laughs> that's what I was going for, all of those emotions. Thank you. It worked. But I think, I think less is, less is, I totally agree with you guys that less can be more because, you know, the, the longer you go, the more you have, uh, uh, or the longer the episode go. Think about how hard it is to actually see, you know, 22 minutes, which is a half hour pilot on, on a, a network sitcom and how hard it is to make a funny version of that with all that talent involved. Now, if you're trying to do that, that's even harder. But if you could just make a minute trailer, sizzle reel, short, short version of it, minute, five minutes, three minutes, whatever it is, then there, it's much more likely you can hit all the points you uh, wanted to hit. And then the executive can, as we going back to this, they can have their input too. They can be like, oh man, I love that trailer. Now, what if we X, Y, and Z for the pilot? And you're like, yes, yes. Mm. My answer is yes to that. <laughs> yeah, if I could throw one last, like kind of meeting in the middle, um, there's like a, it depends where you're at element too, right? Because there was, um, you know, there's, there's a chicken and egg scenario or, you know, catch 22 scenario where like, um, the pilot I did for series fest three was an hour long thing, um, did really well, got meetings with like big, big studios, big, big networks, but was kind of passed on because we made the whole thing, right? Like it was, you know, you made the whole thing. This isn't exactly what we're buying. So like, sorry. But at the same time, if I didn't do that, if I didn't come to Series Fest and some of these other places, like I'm not in that room and that leads to the next thing. Um, so like, you know, I agree with the less is more having lived and learned that lesson, but it's also like you need to be able to get your less in front of people, right? That's and true. if you don't have that ability, then, you know, showing your talent on the longer form might be something that's worthwhile. Totally. Do you think we have time for two more questions, guys? How do you feel? Uh, totally. Sure. Okay. totally. Um, okay, one more uh, from uh, Rob Alicia. He says, how do you approach character arcs when dealing with an ensemble story told in short form? I thought that was good for all of you, Billy. Hi, Rob. Hi, Hello. Rob. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So as, it, as in, are we talking about the type of thing where you focus on one character per short, like for per episode, but it's like a five or 10 minute episode? Yeah, I think like, that. like that having an ensemble cast where you're dealing with multiple 
character arcs and you're also dealing with a condensed time to tell the story maybe over one episode or over right uh, right well i think that's kind of a microcosm of what something like uh a million little things or or this is us or that sort of ensemble type show already is doing which is they focus more on one character than an, than another for for that particular episode but they would make sure to t at least check uh touch in with uh, check check off you know yeah we we ran into this these other characters um we can we can hit those bases without going into depth with them but so ev so an episode might focus on one character but they would um at least mention other characters others would come in and out so we know that they're not lost that they're going to come back and have a, a fuller arc in a, in a later episode does that make sense yeah mm -hmm. anyone else no that's that's it that's you, i mean you can't even do it like even a half hour you know look at community or any other half hour comedy that's trying to juggle juggle an ensemble piece they had they always fall into the convention of this is this story Here's Sam, I, uh, you know, like this is this person's story. Uh, Simpsons do it. it, it I, I don't think there's any way around it because juggling an ensemble piece in an hour long, that's hard enough and it's hard barely enough. can get done. Yeah. I think there's something to, to pull from um, uh, sequence structure a little bit here. Uh, sequence structure is sort of the idea that, that it, and it's made for movies, not for television necessarily, but it works just as well. Just the idea that if you look at a movie, you can break it down into these eight to 12 minute chunks and each chunk has its own little arc that propels the, the whole forward, kind of also fractal thinking, as you said earlier. Um, but the, the thing that wowed me about that way of thinking is that each sequence can have its own protagonist. And of course you've got a structural protagonist for the whole thing, but you know, you can step away from that protagonist for 10 minutes to tell the story of their loved one or their enemy or you know, whatever. And so I think yeah. that, that sort of lends itself to your, your thought process there. Yeah, I think if you're looking for like an actionable item in, in keeping those other ensemble people like threaded into whoever that, you know, singular protagonist is, is like figure out their function in the narrative, right? Function as relates to that, that main character, you know, and, and what are they generating, whether it's obstacles, whether it's assistance, and then you can keep the connective tissue that way um, before handing it off for, for subsequent things. Totally. All right, here is the last one. Um, and I think it's perfect because we kind of talked a lot of different resources and things, um, but Yvette Walter says, hello, she's excited to be here. She's a new writer and attempting to write her first series based on a book that she wrote. Awesome. Is there a blueprint or guideline that we would suggest that she follow? So I, we've talked a lot about resources. So like, what are your resources? and? and your kind of inspirations. I mean, Jake, you mentioned you're reading a lot of screenplays. Like, are there books that you're looking to or courses, those kind of things? Read the kind of screenplays that your show is in. Like, this is what I want my show to be and then read them and then watch them and then like read read more. I'll, I'll let people answer, but yeah. I, have, I have some books too. Hold on. I'll, I'll, I want to take that. I would take that one step further. I would say write, and I, I do this all the time. I would write down the beats of my favorite pilot um, that that resembled that's a comp that's the pilot that I, I would like to most replicate with this particular project. Um, and you'd write down the beats, and then you write that down in the left column, and then you have a right column, and you copy those exact beats. Uh, obviously, it's different characters. Obviously, it's a different major dilemma but you're just copying those exact beats of that thing you want to replicate. It, I, again, it will end up evolving naturally, but no, all pilots and all screenplays, for the most part, they all follow the exact same formula. And so no one's gonna say, oh, this is too much like that pilot because you have brand new characters, you have a brand new perspective, um, et cetera. But I would say, um, and, and a lot of the great, writers I've heard, st I, I've uh, heard or heard talk started exactly that way. They would just take their favorite pilot or their favorite episode of Golden Girls or whatever it is and just replicate it beat by beat. And it works because they all follow the same format. What's nice about TV pilots too, or TV in general, number one, they're super easy to get your hands on. 
and just Google them. And number yeah. two, they most of the time they will indicate their act breaks, and that is very helpful. We want to talk about the added challenge in that question, though, of adapting from a book. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. I'm a yeah. firm believer yeah. <laughs> that different. Uh, this is a frustration I have with, uh, I guess, our industry right now. I think people say, well, if it's a good this, it can make a good that, and like. Your, this book could be a great series and that series could be a great poem and that poem could be a great movie. And I think there's a reason that these art forms are, are different and sometimes they overlap. And I'm not saying that if you get the opportunity of a lifetime, you should turn it down. But there are very unique challenges in trying to take a book and move it to, to a series or a movie. And I think that might be worth also addressing um, both with the, the author of the book, if you require those rights, and also just being aware of from a structural perspective. Well, also, especially if I if I'm remembering the question, she is the author of the book as well. Okay. Um, and so I think that is in some ways good, and in some ways another challenge, mm. um, because I think you're really going to have to be able to let go of some of the content that you have in the book. Um, I love books, I love novels, they're my first love, they're my, they remain, even though I'm in this industry, my favorite um, storytelling art form. I think you can say so much in a book um, in a way that's totally unique and you have so much access to a character's head and trying to translate that on, on the screen is difficult. Um, it's really hard to show internal process on the screen in the same way that you can read it and fully understand it in a book. And I think that's where a lot of adaptations fail for me personally, is that they try to take a story that happens so much inside of a character's head and they fail to come up with a device to map to that or a plot event to map to that that lets us externalize it and get right. out of the character's head and really watch it happen instead of just kind of watching a character brooding, which can obviously is effective in some points, but can become not, not great material for a series. Um, I think the good thing about trying to adapt a book to a series as, as opposed to a movie is that you do have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of movie adaptations of books fail because they try to cram an entire book into, into a movie screenplay, which is just not enough room. And so the story feels disjointed and, and too summarized. So I think TV is a great um, uh, medium for, for, for moving a book to, but I think, yeah, keeping all of that stuff in mind and really letting yourself really asking yourself what about this story lends itself really well to television to visuals to externalization of your internal yeah. thought processes and then the, the last thing for someone who is moving from prose to to screenplays of any kind um pick any structure format you like pick any any good thinker around this whether it's sequence structure or or, or it does it almost doesn't matter but then be rigorous about sticking to it for the first couple and really force yourself to land a you know i don't know a hook at page 12 and a lock in at page 24 more than you would if you'd already done five or six of them and i'm, I'm that those page numbers are for for film writing not for tv writing so amend that a little bit but pick any structure and then really be rigorous because the propensity to just kind of like let the novel play out over 40 episodes, 50 episodes, 70 episodes, it's just gonna be there. Right. Yeah, and also just, just um, you know, I, I've, I've definitely ad adapted books for the screen and you have to really take the key elements. What are the key beats? What, what are the moments, the, especially the visual moments of a character who has a goal and there's some obstacle for that goal, um, to reaching that goal, what are those key moments? And then you kind of have to throw away the rest, all that internal stuff, all the sort of in-between stuff. Uh, and just, what if you were just to isolate the main turning points and then rebuild the structure using, as, as Scott and Sophie are saying, you know, using classic pilot or screenplay structure. You really have to do a lot of, a lot of you have to kill your darlings. In those, in those novels, cases. novels are telling, movies are showing. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the other side of that is like, what new unique opportunities do you have inside a visual medium that you didn't have inside of novels? And so when you've thrown mm. out all of the bathwater and are left with just half a baby, like how do you add back in some really cool stuff that you didn't have the opportunity to do the first time to make this unique? Um, and, and probably talking to some, if you haven't already been in production, talking to some cinematographers or some visual storytellers of different kinds might be really interesting people to talk to, to say, I have this thing that happens. 
I want to show it. Like, what are all the ways to show it? Yeah. Patrick, did you want to add anything in there? No, I mean, I think they, they kind of covered it. Um, you know, find a structure. I think uh, if you're like just starting out, there's one, the TV writers work book or workshop, Ellen Sandler, I think it is. Um, you know, it's not like something I stand by, but like when I've kind of introduced some people to TV writing, she breaks it down, you know, that, that TV structure um, really um, kind of meticulously and in a way that's easy to understand. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you guys, we are 10 minutes over and I, I personally know that we could all talk to each other all night <laughs> um, and, and keep chewing all this over. Um, but I'm going to uh, wrap it up here and just say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this and um, for being such wonderful and supportive parts of this series Fest family. And um, do you guys want to talk really, really briefly about what you're working on now or where we could see something that you worked on, like where you are in that? I know like you guys have uh, stuff on Ficto, Patrick and, and Jake, mm -hmm. um, brothers from the suburbs and Adventure Capital. What's going on in Scott and Sophie world? Uh, yeah, we are, uh, we're currently at that crazy wall phase um, <laughs> in a new series that we're working on. I don't know if we can, it's the one that we were, we were kind of talking about the real estate yeah. yeah. thing. Um, so we are knee deep in that and um, you can, what, what do we have? We have our trailer for Currency Online. If you just yeah, look at the I'm Currency sure trailer, it's up there, you can see that. Trailer um, is honestly so important. We should do a whole conversation about like yeah. how important the trailer is. <laughs> I mean, it's its own writing, editing, creation art form. Totally. Yeah. Um, Claire, thank you so much for putting this together also while we're, while we're chatting cool. about that. Like Series Fest is just genuinely one of the most amazing experiences that uh, creators independent creators can go through. I think mm -hmm. you guys are um, just absolutely top of the line in terms of fostering and uh, giving back to your creators and working and, and to create a community, mm -hmm. uh, testament to the fact that we're all here um, yeah. and happy to be so, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I recommend I recommend Series Fest to everyone with with a great project that, uh, that I come across. I'm like, did you enter Series Fest yet? <laughs> uh, all the time. That's why I had to read so many scripts this year. Is that, this is your fault now? <laughs> part I'll, I'll i'll take some of the blame sure um <laughs> but uh yeah and you can see my uh my pilot um which started as a short film uh lemon it's the link is in the in this chat and um and i was uh, about to pitch a new sitcom series um when this all went down so that's sort of on on hold for the time being but you know now that people are a lot more open of course to pitching yeah. by Zoom instead of in person. So so that we'll see if that uh, happens anyway and just creating new new pilots and new series. So going through all this uh, personally and with my my script consulting clients pretty much every single day. So <laughs> I, I live, eat and breathe it, but I but I love it. And I really am grateful um, to all you guys and, and especially like Claire and Lauren for, for setting this all up. It's fantastic. Thank you guys, go eat dinner. It's really late in New York. I'm sorry I kept like all of you up late and Patrick no, it's worth it. Chicago. It's, <laughs> it's 9 p.m. It's not that late. We have nothing to do. Sorry, um, uh, Jake and Willie, uh, Jake and Patrick, do you guys want to tell everyone where they can see your show or did you already well, tell us, right, the names of the show? Sure, so we're on Ficto, the uh, streaming mobile platform. Uh, my show is Brothers from the Suburbs, Jake. Yeah, it, Adventure Capital. We're super proud of it. And we're right next to each other, Patrick, on the app. Yeah. So you can Aww. go one by one. Can't nice. miss it. Double feature. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Well, thank, you. Thank, you thank you very thank much. You for having us. And we'll see you next week in the virtual space. We've got more creator hangouts. So tune in. Cool. Thank Bye. you, Claire. Bye, Bye guys. guys. Bye, everyone.